Max, thanks for joining us today. Really appreciate you taking time out of your day. Um, this is the, I don't even know what episode this will come out on the, on the Coachcast. Um, but before, I know everyone knows of you or about you in one way or another. Um, but just for those kind of one or two people on the whole planet that maybe don't, can you just give us a quick, uh, quick introduction and what you're, what you're up to and your, your journey? I'm sure there's a lot more than one or two. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, um, I, I am the director of sports science at Resilience Code. Uh, I've dabbled in everything from tech to nutrition and marketing and kind of a little bit of everything in between. I have an athletic training background, so I'm ATC certified. I'm a strength coach. I'm just a, 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 a connoisseur of human performance. We'll call it that. I appreciate it all. And so um, right now, where I got a lot of things going on. Uh, I'm going to give my cheap plug off the bat early and often, right? So we're working on the EDGU right now, which is a web educational website and something I'm passionate about because it allows me to, um, as, as, as we know, based on our previous conversation here, my erratic thoughts can uh, be put onto paper and uh, in presentation form. So it helps uh, people learn daily. We've got a lot of staffs using it. So it's fun to keep that up going. And obviously, you know, the, uh, uh, the, the daily work of an actual job of being a director of sports science and all the fun that uh, comes along with that as well. So how do you actually combine that, the amount of content that you're putting out for Edu, which is phenomenal by the way, and then your daily job? How I'm, cra that, I'm crazy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm a very patient fiance, put it that way. I'll wake up early. I'll make a pot of coffee. Um, I'll drink a lot of coffee. I'll make a lot of presentations. I've gotten really good at it that I can crank out Gosh, uh, presentations without pause. So I, if I have 30 minute window and they're each 10 minutes, I can get three done. Um, I can, if I have five that are, you know, five, six minute ones, I can get five done. And so my goal, I'm very competitive. Anybody who's met me is I get really competitive with myself and I want to be and make the single most amount of content in the S and C world in one year. So I've literally put out a new video every single week. Oh, I start every single day on edu. And so that's a video that's basically six to 15 minutes long every single day um, ever since we've launched it. And, and so uh, there's new stuff literally every day designed to help you learn more. And that's my competitive goal. I have made that commitment to myself. I'm going to do, I'm going to post on strong by science. I'm going to post on at strong by science, the education one, I'm gonna post on edu. And uh, I, I have too many thoughts in my head. And the more I do stuff, the more thoughts I get and the more outlets I need. So it all works hand in hand. I do that all in the morning too. So you can, you can do it all before, you know, 6.30. Wake up, do it. Just get it out. Get that content out there. So Absolutely, that's, that's, yeah. For those young entrepreneurs out there, it's just get the content out. And So what time do you start your day then? What, is a, what does a typical day look like for you? Oh, uh, man, it really depends. Um, 6, 6 a.m., 6, 5.45 sometimes, but lately a little later because – I'm not going to the office, mm -hmm. so I'm able to, you know, I'm not waking up to go to the office. I work from home, so it gives me like another 45-minute window because I don't have to be as presentable as I might be otherwise. Um, and I haven't worn, you know, not showering and deodorant in the morning, so I can uh, wake up and get more done. I thought and you were going to say I haven't worn pants. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't worn a shirt. I put a shirt on for this, but I had a basketball jersey on before this. <laughs> yeah, and so that's basically routine. Um, I want to find a way every day to – do something that gets me closer to my goals and um, you don't always have a defined goal, but you know, you want to be something more. And so I can't always define what I should do that day, but I know if I do something that's obviously better than nothing. For sure. And then what, so what led, led you to start like strong by science, that platform? Cause that was, I don't, even know, <laughs> I don't even know when I was introduced to it, but I was like, wow, this is some phenomenal information being mm. out here. It's easily digestible. Like what made you do that? Uh, I was doing uh, I was grad school at Iowa state and um, I didn't, I don't really use Instagram that much. The irony behind that, like I have a personal page and I don't, you know, I, I, I used to, um, I followed West side barbell a lot. So I liked and their exercises that they'd share and I followed some other people. And I was like, well, this is really cool. You know, people are sharing information. And it was kind of earlier than it was 2017. So here, like, here's a little side story. Uh, you know, strength coach therapy, Teddy, uh, I used to have Teddy Thursdays before he's all big and famous. Now he, I used to feature him on my page because him and I kind of were doing this thing at the same time. And we were like, Oh, Hey dude, I didn't know him personally, but I knew he was sharing some stuff One of the pages I followed. So he had like 300 followers when we started funny enough. And, 
it was one of those things where I, uh, I, I just wanted to share information and I was, I was really self-conscious when I first started it. So I didn't put my name on it ever. I, I did it anonymously because I didn't think people would want to know who I am and I didn't want it about me, but more, it was like, I was kind of afraid that, you know, someone would judge me. Yeah. Um, and so I started anonymous and I started sharing stuff and things I've been learning and was going through and I wish I knew earlier. And I just tried sharing it in a way in which I learned it. But I didn't want to try and share it in a way that um, put it on a pedestal. Like I didn't want to, like, oh, look at these, you know, big words I'm using and look at uh, how well it's written. It was more like, hey, I learned it yesterday and now I want to share it. I'm going to share it the same way that it made sense in my head. And so that way it's always been translatable. It's not coming from like an ivory tower, um, someone trying to be uh, uh, above you. And I've always been kind of cognizant of trying to make it um, digestible. And so even now, if I'm more versed in an area and I use a word that might be a little more confusing, always then follow it up with something that you yourself three years ago would have need to have prefaced or come after for you to understand it. So like, uh, again, like, you could say fancy things like neuroendocrinology, or you could say things like um, your body sends hormones in the blood. <laughs> and the, like yeah. cause most people know what a hormone is, um, or you could use the fancier term and they got to go Google it. So I always try using both not to get, you know, too sidetracked here. For sure. No, no, I love that. And then it's just breaking it down. Cause for someone like me as well, it's, I've got to read something so many times before I actually like break it down and digest it. So things like your posts or whatever it is, where the example you just use there is so much easier to understand. So you don't have to constantly revisit and revisit and revisit just to understand what the term means. Anyone who's read a research paper been like, dude, this stuff is pain in the ass to read. Like, and it's not against the research paper because they have certain standards. And if you've ever written a research paper, there's reasons why they write it that way and why it's so succinct and not informal and overly verbose. Um, but at times when as a consumer, they, they, they're trying, they might have word count limits literally on the paper they submit. And so they're not going to sit there and inform you what uh, motor learning is. They're not going to sit there and always inform you what myoglobin is. You know, they're not going to tell you then myoglobin comma, you know, uh, the, the binding protein for oxygen within a muscle. No, they're just going to say myoglobin. And then you're going to be like, what the hell is a myoglobin? But in our end, we can, I'm not held to those standards. I'm not submitting something to, you know, I only got 1200 words or however many words you got to write. So I can be a little more verbose and I can have typos and I can spell things wrong and I can, uh, it be a little more informal because I'm not representing a journal. I'm merely representing myself. For sure. And then on that, then let's get into learning processes. And then essentially what we just talked about, synthesizing information, breaking down research. How do we, if we're looking at, so let's go back to maybe 18 year old Chris. Okay. I'm fresh at university back in the UK, excited to get into my physiology class gets like lecturer professor says chris i needed to read this uh, this research article just hits me i'm like shit i've never seen this before in my life <laughs> what do i do what's the best way to go about it okay there's a couple of ways and you probably can get me on some weird tangent here but I'll, I'll try and be not uh too off the wall um it's first off how do you appraise it as a person is this a challenge or is this something i'm fearful of because a lot of times when i read this stuff i was like dude this stuff sucks i'm i don't want to read it it makes me stressed out Versus now I read it and it's like a discovery process. Oh, I want to learn what that word means. Um, so what I highly recommend for someone who is, um, you know, wanting to learn it, but have maybe is limited in some of the, the wording of it as itself is open up a Google tab next to you. And as you read it, understand the introductions, this many, many lit review. And if you don't understand the introduction well, and some of the papers referenced because they reference a paper and specifically even talk about a result of that paper, it's going to be important to the conclusion. There's a reason why they're presenting it. So if you don't understand it, well, let's go to the reference and let's go into that paper first. Then you can, um, you know, do get to the introduction kind of deal. And then uh, once you're through there, obviously I hope you read the abstract before, because you should read that before people say, don't read it. And I'll read the abstract first because it gives you at least some sort of roadmap as to what's coming. Yeah. Then, so if you were to give a specific A, B, C, D, this is the order you read this, is that what it would be? Abstract? Absolutely. Title. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I read some titles of papers. I'm like, I'm not reading that. Like, I don't care how great it is. I can't, I'm not interested because read something you like. Obviously, if it's school, and you're stuck reading something, read the abstract. Okay. Then read the introduction. And this is how I do it. So it's how I learn. 
if it's wrong, whatever, you guys can deal with it. Um, I skip through and I go through the results and I look for graphs, especially graphs that are easy to understand because it's going to give you some understanding as to what they're trying to highlight in their result itself, i.e., look at this strong correlation or look at the time interval of cortisol levels, one hour, two hour, three hours post meal. Okay, I understand now what they're trying to highlight because the discussion is probably going to reference some of those graphs and the conclusion for sure is going to be concluding based on some of the highlighted results. Now the results and methods can be tricky because sometimes you're just not familiar with it. They might say things like a linear position transducer, which is just a gym aware of what you call it or a tendo unit, but a linear position transducer, what the hell is that? So those are typically big obstacles that are going to turn you off from reading the rest of the paper. I save them for the end typically. Now you do read them. I save them for the end because if I hit something and they're telling me they're using some silver nitrate assay, I'm like, I'm not sure what that is. But that's not always important for you as much as it is for the researcher, because as the researcher, you might reference some of their methods, because if you want to study something similar, you might use those methods. And if you're standing in front of a committee of professors, you have to justify your methods. So if you can show that previous people used your methods, you've justified them and you can actually use that in your thesis defense. So understand like how academia actually works. You can understand a little bit more about how a paper works and why it's written in a certain way. So I go abstract, I go intro, I skim through big picture results, I'll go to a discussion, I'll go to a conclusion, and then I'll go back into the methods and results and find some of the specifics. I like it, it's nice, just relatively easy to, to break down and, and synthesize that. And is, is, mm -hmm. there, is there a way that, I suppose even strength coaches with limited time, should they be should they be diving into research articles and things like this, or should they be just looking at kind of what's what's currently working? Because we know that for the most part, the um, the coaches on the floor are ahead of the research. Like, how do we bridge that gap? Oh, you think that? <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, I mean force velocity profile has been around since like the '60s. Yeah. So I mean, we're not really that far ahead as we think we are. Do you think we like to think we're ahead. Conception? Absolutely. Yeah. How many, how many, and this isn't like an egotistical, arrogant thing, but I don't like that term because what it does, it belittles the research. Mm -hmm. Oh, we're ahead of it. So we don't need it. That's not true. Not true at all. Like if you, you, if you, do you think coaches do that because they may be scared to look at the research? No, I don't, don't think that how, either. I don't know how to look at the research. I, I, I think right now the issue with a lot of things is they don't have time, uh -huh. right? It's not a coach's don't want to learn. That's silly. They coaches all want to, I don't want to say all, but a lot of coaches want to do the best for their athletes yep. and they want to learn more. The problem is the way our society has been distributing information and the way they consume it. There's a lot of burdens of entry in order to read a research paper. I have to go through a full paper. That's not a little paper. It's typically like six pages. It might take me 20 minutes. It might yield nothing of interest for me. So I only have 20 minutes. I want to spend that with my family, right? I want to do other things that are on the floor coaching people. And that's okay. Like I totally get that. And so again, which is why we're trying to find ways to produce content so they can digest it and make it applicable. But also there should be a level of appreciation that coincides with it. For example, I, I know that I might not be able to read all the papers. I'm coaching seven teams. I get it. That's your job. Your job, you don't make money researching papers. So what's the incentive behind it? But on top of that is we want to appreciate that we might not know a lot of things. For example, we don't know as we in the research world, I'm not a researcher, but let's just say if I was, we, the research world doesn't know how the brain works, period. It's not fully understood and the brain controls everything, right? And so if the brain controls everything and we don't fully understand the brain, there's no way we can be fully understanding everything else. Yeah. Um, we don't understand endocrinology to the fullest. We don't understand how hormones work to the fullest, right? Because there's a debate, a certain thing like IGF-1 has been associated with breast cancer later in life, but they also thought IGF-1 was associated with longevity, higher IGF-1 and longer. Well, now they think maybe that IGF-1 could lower because it's a complex system and it's actually lowering as a means for another reason that we haven't identified yet. And that's just one of many things that happen. So it's, it's not this um a level of we don't know anything and it's not a level of we know everything but we know some things we have a hunch on others and we need to appreciate a whole lot of other stuff for sure and then do we 
so with that other stuff, do we leave that up to people like yourself maybe to break down and synthesize that information? That's what we kind of we it, look at or what do we do to understand that stuff? Now the flaw the flaw comes to the educational system. Mm -hmm. Right. As as it, it's the only profession you get a scalpel before you learn the physiology. Right. You, you don't get a you get a you don't learn the insides out you learn the outside in. The first thing you learn as a coach is an exercise. Right? If you go through a lot of ex-phys programs, mm -hmm. there's like exercise 101 and you learn what a squat is and a lunge is. That's very important. Don't get me wrong. But th that's literally for that. That should be the curriculum if you literally just coached movements. But as coaches, we're, we're beyond that. We are synthesizers of lots of information. And we basically, we, we, use, we like to use the word prescribe exercises. So if we're prescribing exercises, we better be able to understand how the human body adapts to an exercise. So I think at an educational level, integrative physiology is not taught in an applicable manner. The reason why a lot of people tune out physiology, biochemistry, um, neurology, uh, endocrinology is because as a student, you took it and you always took it because it's a med school prep. It was like, learn the details of endocrinology and uh, the, the ins and outs of things that you didn't really care about. And no one ever said it, like, how does it apply to training? How does a redox state of a mitochondria make a difference in someone's overtraining? And why does an initial inflammatory state reduce adaptive capacity? Did you know that if you had two groups of the Taekwondo study, two, two groups, they classified them strictly on inflammatory states. They had the same training protocol. The group that had a lower inflammatory state had better adaptations despite doing the same training protocol. So what does that tell us? We could give someone the best training protocol in the world, but if they're in a, in a perturbed internal state, it doesn't matter what exercise we give them, they're not getting the best out of it. The same has been shown in a chronic stress group. They had three groups. They had high, medium, and low. In those three groups, they did a very, very demanding exercise and a 96 hour recovery protocol. So super, super, that exercise was like ridiculously difficult. It was like a hundred sets of eccentric, like um, leg press to failure. It was like the most God awful I can't imagine them walking for like the next two <laughs> weeks. I remember reading them, like, holy crap. But what happened was we had um, the, the low stress group, psychological, chronic stress, had super compensation by 96. They were higher than they were before. The, the high and moderate stress groups never returned to baseline. So how can we appreciate what exercise we give someone, again, keyword appreciate, yeah. if that outcome is so variable based on the internal state of the body? And so if we don't have that, you know, I use the word cool, like it is cool to learn that stuff. As a student, how do we expect to get that spark ignited later on? So how do we, what do we do? If I was to say, okay, blank canvas, Max, redesign the educational system. <laughs> this could be a long episode, but we, we won't go too far. But like, what would you do? What would you be our pointers? How, how do we redesign the educational system? I think it has to be, um, there, again, the simplest answer, because I don't want to go into like, you know, how people literally learn in that process, yep. but it's allowing more examples that are tailored to the students in the class. For example, my physiology class just happened to be a bunch of nurses. Everything was always nurses. Nothing was ever, how do I make a guy fast like Usain Bolt? I've right, been on the edge of my chair. And this same thing happens to us because what happens is we get these sports science books, super training. People go, oh, that book, it stinks. It's too hard to understand. Because what happens is we're so used to trying to find an answer because no one's helped us connect dots in the past. What happens is if an educational system helped us draw parallels to our profession, we begin to learn to draw connections. So I have like a model of how ideas are generated. I'm a true believer that there's two ways. You can aggregate information and then you have to have a, some sort of promotive force or some sort of uh, energetic force that drives it. So the ability to think on something. So you need two variables. How do I take in information? And then how do I think about the information that I've taken in that draws connections to certain areas? But if no one's ever challenged or helped us learn how to make those connections, then it becomes very difficult. We can take in information and I can learn about a mitochondria and I go, okay, cool. But then for some reason we forget that a mitochondria is at the neuromuscular junction of a cell and the mitochondria of a neuromuscular junction can actually change based on redox state. And that can be one of the reasons why, a mito, why the nerve itself de-innervates from muscle. And if it's de-innervating from a muscle, an older adult, you're telling me the mitochondria doesn't play a role in elite athlete at the neuromuscular junction and how optimizing that cellular redox state for potential adaptation could be a really cool concept or at least something to get a coach interested about for future performance. Right? It's, it's this yeah. concept that we don't always think about.
it's like it's go it's just going to that next level as well and it's it, like you say it's making that it's making that connection because I, I i was that guy sat in physiology class physiology I, I sucked at school you know? <laughs> I, I almost flunked out of my first freshman year in college i play i was really good at mario kart i could kick your ass on double dash um <laughs> I didn't give a shit about school. I played basketball. I thought I was going to go play in Europe. I was a little D3 hooper who wasn't that good, but I thought I was going to go play in Europe. I didn't give a flying crap about basketball. Um, I somehow stumbled into an athletic training certification and a uh, you know, double major by dumb luck because my friend told me to apply for it. I didn't even know what an athletic trainer was when I applied. My buddy was doing it. So I was like, yeah, I'll do it. Oh, sounds cool. Athletic training, neat. Um, and then I did the class. I was like, okay, this is cool. But I enjoyed it and I passed. Um, but I didn't care about school. I never cared about school. I didn't care about any of this until I got out of it and I got into grad school and I was kind of stuck alone with a bunch of books. And what happened was there's a, a section of Iowa state. It's like this like cranny looking cranny, like in between like the walls, there's this weird like catacomb area and it had all these old, old books on uh, like Russian sports training. And I remember I had done, I'd done the internship at University of Iowa. I felt embarrassed at how little I knew because we read Science and Practice of Strength Training, a book that you probably didn't read in your exercise curriculum, which is a really cool book, by the way, because it does yeah. tell you a little bit how this stuff connects. I read it and I go, oh my gosh, I'm so stupid. So then I went and checked out, I had unlimited books I could check out. I checked out every single book on the topic, every single strength initiative. I brought them all home and said, screw every other grad student. I got them all. There's no limit. <laughs> so I had Pavel Komi's. I had Zatorsky's. I had um, these Russian books, which I don't even remember what they were, but they were really cool. I had these old biomechanic books. And I sat down and said, I will not be embarrassed again in this situation. And I'm going to become hyper competitive about this. And I'm not going to let myself feel dumb again. And that was an internal driver, but that was a failure of the education system prior to because I should have been excited to learn about this. This shouldn't have happened because my back's against the wall and I was interning with Nick DeMarco and they all made me feel stupid because I thought I was high and mighty because I was an athletic trainer and I go in there and feel like a dipshit. Well, and I felt embarrassed because I was a former athlete and I like winning. And so I'm like, forget this. I'm not letting someone out read me. I'm not going to happen. So, and so I sat what, what you're saying is it's Nick's fault. <laughs> oh, it's Nick's the reason. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I, oh, I didn't read shit. I didn't have no, we can ask any of my friends. I didn't do anything relatively intellectual. Well, that's, that's interesting what you said in terms of, it's just the exposure. Um, Absolutely. It's, exposure it's making people stuff. excited about it. The issue with the strength conditioning portion and not strength conditioning, but we, we don't always dive into the, the science because there's no Bill Nye. There's no one who makes it cool. Everyone likes a volcano because Bill Nye as a little kid told you how to make a volcano. And I thought tectonic plates in the earth crust were the coolest thing in the world. And I love dinosaurs because he just talked about it all the time. Why can't we have a beacon of information in the strength conditioning community that makes this something fun, something exciting. It's not coming down as belittling. Oh, you don't know this. You don't know this. You don't know this. It's like, no, let's learn this. Let's discover this. Encourage kids to come and experiment, understand how biomechanical efficiencies and or inefficiencies can play a long-term role in metabolic cost, allostasis in your endocrinology because it's exciting. It's neat. It actually will push things forward as opposed to redundancies of going over which exercise is best. Well, who cares what exercise is best if you can't adapt because your body's not in a good state yeah. right so it's like this huge uh yeah I don't know, i'm passionate about it obviously but uh it's it's something that like i i found it so exciting the minute i i started to see it as a discovery process and i wish others could see it that way as opposed to this intimidation process i think and i think what you mentioned earlier on as well it's the way you interpret going back a little bit but when you read the abstract like you say, it's discovery. You're reading it. It's like, okay, look at it. And you don't know what these big confusing words mean, but that's a good thing. That's, there's the opportunity to learn. You mm -hmm. just straight away, you open that Google tab and you get to work. Well, no, no exercise is going to give you an edge. Every coach likes exercises. No shit. We all like working out. Okay. You're not going to develop some new exercise that's going to make someone Usain Bolt. You're not gonna, but there's a potential to get an edge by understanding detailed physiology. That's like the, in my opinion, like the, the furthest step that we can get in as, as a performance community is to really then appreciate that. Like in Russia, we talk about it. We have mentioned before. It's like no one, if you've read the management of a, a weightlifter, I believe it's called, uh, God, I can't remember the guy's name. It's like lose with an L or a P or it's uh, a great book. Point is they were doing integrative medicine in it, but we wanted to look at it and say, Oh, you know, how much does someone hang clean? 
Oh, did we not realize they were doing blood work every week? They have a readiness test in there. They did eight readiness tests before someone did worked out. They did orthostatics, which is your blood pressure when you sit, the blood pressure when you stand, and then the blood pressure you three minutes after you stand, and whether or not you have uh, basically a deviation in it, which is postural orthostatic syndrome. Then they look at how far someone jumped with their eyes closed to see if someone had some sort of issue going on with uh, – um, you know, some sort of like, they're not to say brain function, but someone's motor learning or they, their neuro awareness, they would do max jump heights. They had a series of eight tests to assess readiness. And the eight tests were subdivided based on physiological systems, the nervous system, your hypothalamus, pituitary, adrenal. So you basically your stress response was the orthostatics. They had physiological power, such as jump height. They had self-assessment readiness. They had a galvanic skin one, which was for some sort of conductance, again, for stress related. And they were doing this because they knew the body was systemic. They knew that if you could uh, manipulate physiology and understand physiology, then you could perform well, a la, oh, no one's testing for steroids. Well, we know we can probably <laughs> juice a bunch of people up. We know physiology is where it comes from. It's really interesting because it, it, it's, it's a parallel with health. The best health status you're in, the higher your adaptive capacity becomes and your ability to receive a stimulus becomes greater. Your ability to adapt to a stimulus becomes greater. So that kind of, well, leads us on to a point, actually, I think we were talking about off camera, which is the West's interpretation of the literature mm -hmm. in terms of the studies that the Russians and things did. And it's like, we literally just just interpret as, oh, he lifted X percent on a Monday and he lifted this on a Tuesday instead of actually yeah. <laughs> diving into the details of actually what matters. I was reading a paper the other day that, you know, I was kind of curious and I was like, oh, you know, Olympic weightlifters in Russia train five times a day. So I was like, oh, you know, pretty interesting how the hell they pull that off. And so I was reading it and they did two exercises, the whole, for each workout. Okay. Well, they took like seven minutes of rest. They didn't confound themselves into an architect of, cultural um cultural wants and needs a la we only have an hour to work out therefore we have to work out for one hour so we're going to comprise a whole workout no they were like well i think the physiology would respond better if we didn't crush you every single workout so i can be as fresh as possible and as strong as possible over and over and over again and we interpret it as oh they worked out five times a day what animals but you didn't understand you know you don't read it as like, well they didn't really crush themselves they took their time but didn't Louis Simmons as well introduce that to kind of America to an extent in terms of breaking up those, those training blocks? Absolutely. They talked about how he trained, you know, like 14 times, had these little mini training blocks. And it makes mm -hmm. sense. It really does. If you look at it, the, the theoretical cellular level, like uh, how much of a stress, just re remove current sta status of life and think about it as an evolutionary being. Um, you don't see a dog go out and run around for an hour and a half straight as hard as it can. Yeah. Right. It'll sit down on a tired plane. Um, no other animal is actively imposing a metabolic stressor that's quite large, mind you, for an hour and a half straight, just arbitrarily. And that's what we're doing as humans when we train. We are imposing an hour and a half to an hour long, high metabolic stressor. Like, I don't understand in what environment a human being would ever have to lift that much weight within an hour unless their, their role of survival is to move boulders around. I'm not really sure. And, and so like, why do we then make the assumption that it's optimal for physiology when no other animal in the animal kingdom does anything remotely like it? By the point, yeah. I mean, I, I don't have an answer. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, imposed, yeah. it's imposed upon constraints of society, right? We work at 8 a.m. and we get home at 5. Mm -hmm. You want to see your family, so you have a one-hour window to work out. Yeah. So we've been constantly trying to figure out what's the minimal or what's the effective dose for a single workout. But if we're looking at athletic performance where athletes don't have to follow those same realms, especially professional, professional athletes, maybe we should look at it differently. Maybe we should look at the whole day. Do you think microdosing comes into that a little bit? Not to get too far off topic, but no, not necessarily microdosing, but it's just a lot of dosing. <laughs> That's what they did, right? <laughs> it's like microdosing five times a day, which is a big deal. Yeah. yeah. Um, and again, like if it's if microdosing, people like because no one's ever too tired. If you think about adaptive capacity, you have an adaptive spectrum. You have minimal effective dose, which is the smallest amount of stimulus you can provide and still get adaptation. Mm -hmm. But people also forget there's a maximal effective dose, which is the most amount of stimulus you can apply 
apply and get the maximal adaptation. The minimal effective dose errs on the side of applying too little so you never get adaptation. The maximal effective dose error is if I apply too much, then I have wasted metabolic and physiological substrates to adapt. Because anything beyond that, you're wasting ad adaptation because you're spending time simply trying to recover versus adapting. So it's obviously safer from a minimal effective dose, but that doesn't mean optimal because maximal effective dose by definition means optimal. Perfect. There you go. And I'm just going to, I'm going to move on a little bit because like I said, I don't want to take too much of your time, but I, I want to move on to touch on like sports science. I know you've had a lot to do obviously with um, a few of the uh, or should I say businesses and things like that that you've worked on or projects you worked on? But I want to know in particular about the small school, like applied sports science. What, what, does that, what does that look like? How can we use sports science better within not necessarily the big D1 school that can throw money left, right, and center, but maybe a smaller school that doesn't have that budget? Like, what should those schools do? Um, I don't like the term sports science at all. Uh, <laughs> I hate it. Personally, I don't think it means anything. I don't think people know what it means. When people talk about sports science, they think technology and coding. Mm -hmm. um, okay, cool. Like that's not sports science, that's computer science. Let's not get that twisted. Um, we need to think about human science. And so the question okay. becomes, as a practitioner, how can I better understand the human body? And by default, sometimes that means using technology to infer a physiological state. For example, I might get WHOOP or some HRV tracker to infer autonomic states of stress. Fair. I might use a VBT to infer, again, you can make a big infer, inference on this one, um, acute ability to produce power, so readiness, fatigue. You could use it as a check engine light. For example, if I use VBT, velocity-based training, or jump height, the simplest version, jump height, okay? If I measure how high someone jumps and they jump not as high, why don't they jump as high? I don't know and neither do you. The fact of the matter is we don't know. It's a check engine light. We know they didn't jump as high today as they did yesterday. And we can infer that they are fatigued. Now, where the fatigue stem from can be multiple levels. Is it nutritional? Did they not get the caloric needs and macro and micro needs they had from the day before? Is there psychological stress? There are studies that show that psychological stress reduces our ability to uh, recover day to day. Is it sleep? Sleep shown that as well. Is it the workload? okay, why does athlete A recover and athlete B not recover? So it becomes a check engine light. And why that's important is because you can then modify what you can control. You can't control athlete B and athlete A's entire life, but you can control the stimulus you're going to apply to them. And so if I'm measuring jump height, I have a deviation from the norm that's either below, let's assume below, and I'm fatigued, well, I know it's happening from a suboptimal Physi psychophysiological state. Wonderful. If that trend continues to decline, while well, others do not decline because we can use that as an outlier and say, look, they're not adapting like the rest. Okay, I can now look at it and say, what's going on? Do I need to have some sort of nutritional intervention? Do I need to have some sort of sports psychologist intervention? Maybe something with the sleep? What is causing them to not adapt like the rest? And that's where it becomes technology helping you understand the human body. Because what happens is coaches really want, oh, if you didn't jump as high, you jumped one inch less, well, then uh, you should do this workout instead. But that's, that, that's fixing a symptom not a problem. That's like having a fever and taking Tylenol and not addressing why you got a fever, right? Why do you have the fever in the first place? Is it suboptimal immune, is it immunosuppression, right? Cause you haven't been sleeping enough. Is it lifestyle habits? Is it cause you went and boozed out last night? It really depends, right? And so we cannot keep treating symptoms as if it's the cause. We, a, a, fatigue, a reduction in jump height is a symptom of something. Now what that symptom is, is inferred physiology. It is something going on. Now, the more data points we can collect on specific areas, the better we can pinpoint. There's no autonomic stress. There's no sleep stress. They sleep just fine the past week. Their HRV is just fine the past week. We have a meal log. Their food's just fine the past week. Oh, their loading was really high. Um, and maybe something schooling is happening, so we can assume it's psychological. Maybe they naturally don't adapt like others. And so there's certain things that you can then stratify and break down your actionable insights. But again, it's not coming from you know, some tech, some, some reason sports science has become like, Oh, how can you code? How can, how can you use a VBT? How can you use a GPS? Well, all that stuff is really cool, but it's really useless. If you only, if you think it's a linear system, if you think what you apply manipulates what they do one-to-one, -one, then we're leaving the entire science of training out the window. 
So you've really got to just understand the whole, obviously the whole system. It's not just, oh, this, because I don't know. The jump so it's back, you it's about back to the appreciation. I don't know why they're not jumping as high, but I appreciate there's other variables. Where the issue comes into is when you assume you know. They didn't jump as high. I know my loading was too high. Well, obviously your loading was too high relative to something, but why was it too high? What can we then do to make sure we're covering the steps that we can take to ensure we've understood what we can? And is there, I don't know how to, is there a system that we can use to do this? Or is it literally just saying, okay, we need to know more about the processes well, within the body, yeah, like, physiology, everything? No, let's stratify it. Make it simple. My basketball coach in sixth, grade, in sixth grade said, make it simple with a dimple. Don't try too hard, right? Okay. I don't have access to everything. I don't. Okay, fair. You can't get blood work on athletes. You can't do all the 3D biomechanics. Wonderful. Just okay. But you know fatigue stems from something. So if I can measure upper, and forget, again, this is already a big, big shot in the dark because you're assuming jump height is systemic. Once they bench the same speed, you should probably have upper body and lower body fatigue testing to make sure it's not systemic, but localized. Okay, that's one thing. We can stratify systemic versus localized fatigue. If it's systemic, why is there systemic fatigue? Okay, what can I do as a coach to understand it? Well, maybe I can add subjective RPE because that is an appraisal process that the athlete's going through how hard they thought it was for them. Now we can start to then break down certain areas based on simple subjective and objective metrics to get more information. So when we put it into our probabilistic calculator, we have a better understanding. It's just like playing blackjack. The more cards you see face up, the higher likelihood that you can count the card that's coming next. You've played 15 hands. You're sitting there. You know the deck. There's eight decks in that deck. They shuffle before you play. Each card is dealt. You watch the kings. You watch the queens. And you watch the twos and everything else in between. You have seen more and more cards come up. You see what's showing. You have a better guess what cards are needed. Better guess, not saying you're going to be right. Just trying to give yourself the best chance of success at the end of the day, you know? <laughs> That's all we're doing, right? Yeah. If you don't understand, if we, if we as if the research community can't, you know, solve a common cold, you're really going to expect we can solve complex physiology of athletic performance? No, we can't. Can we get closer yeah. than we were before? Absolutely. Big difference. So right? we'll be, go on, sorry. Yeah, it's a big difference, right? Someone, if you ask someone who made no money and you said you could either, you know, one in a trillion chance you become the richest person in the world or you can have a 50-50 chance that you're in the upper 99% or the upper 50%, I'd probably, you'd probably take the 50-50 the chance, yeah. <laughs> right? So, like, we're not trying to look into a crystal ball and, you know, predict ridiculous you can't predict the weather how are we going to predict the body like come on like there's a lot of basic things in this world that give us a lot more money if we could predict the weather you could pick and predict crops there's far more money in predicting the weather than it's predicting the human body and performance and if capitalism hasn't solved predicting the weather capitalism is not going to solve predicting the human body well I think on that, on that note, my, move on to the, my next point. <laughs> I don't know how I can well, top that, you know. Again, appreciation, right? It's just like a matter of we're trying to do our best to learn. Uh, we're trying to do what we can to understand, to get the accurate more correct. You know, like the weather, sorry. The, the weather more correct. We're trying to predict outcomes a little better. But no, there's no way. There's never been a research paper out of all the years of research that's ever predicted thing with an R squared of one. They will throw it away if they have, especially even for performance. Maybe they predicted some other stuff, but that's an R squared yeah. of one, but you get what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. So is, is there anything, I know obviously like you talked about systemic versus local and whether you do a, a uh, like a jump squat or whatever versus a, a bench press. Is there something that you would advise for these smaller schools that don't have the budget that's, that can count on Ab HIV or anything like that? What Absolutely. That? So simple. Have someone jump in, on a box and ask them how hard it was. Same box height every time. RPE. Okay. That's pretty easy. <laughs> um, you can have, because it's RPE, but it's an, it's an RPE of a specific outcome. Now, if you really wanted to get a little cuter with it, you could have them jump and touch something. And you as a coach could see where they touched. And it's better than nothing. It's all about better than nothing. Okay, there might be a wide amount of variability and repeatability in it, but are you at least going to get more information than nothing? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. 
okay, I don't have anything at all. How can I collect lots of information from the mastermind of my athlete's computer brain? How hard was today's workout? RPE times session duration. All these things are wonderful because they give you more than not. Um, as, a, as a small school with a sports science department that doesn't have the funding, you got to treat it like a startup company. You have to find a way to provide value and show value because then the funding will come to you. How can I connect certain areas to things that maybe aren't performance related, that maybe are higher funding related? How can I show that I am saving the university money on the number of surgeries or something? How can I show the university that I'm doing whatever it is, I'm having more successful All-Americans or helping whatever the heck it is, health of the athletes, uh, that in turn you say, look, I can do this, but imagine if I had this, because now you've taken a lean startup model to it versus a monolithic kind of a uh, corporate thing where you say, I should have this because we are successful. Well, you're not a corporation. You're not a successful corporation. You're a lean little startup that is internal of a larger company that is a university and you're trying to allocate funds to yourself. So you have to provide value and meaningful value to those who allocate those funds. I think that's the key thing that value as well. It's you, people want to know what you can do for them at the end of the day. And it's, it's having that relationship and understanding. And as soon as they start seeing value in what you're doing for the university as a whole, then you're starting to potentially get an extra thousand dollars here or there that you can put into whatever you want. Absolutely. And you can draw more interns because they're interested in learning from you and what you're doing. Lots of things, lots of good things can take place. Perfect. And then so just moving on there away from the, the, uh, the human science, not the sports science as I've, I've learned. Um, if we go, on to, <laughs> if we go on to just, just power development. Okay. So I know you've, on the edge of you, on your Strong by Science site, um, you've put a lot of information, I know you're a basketball athlete, about power development, especially around the vertical jump. Um, and I'm, can we talk a little bit about that, kind of what you've been getting into and understanding recently? And I'm actually interested a little bit to do with the rate of force development and especially that early versus late. Is it that important? Okay. What does it mean for those people that maybe haven't heard of it? So let, let, let's take a step back for a minute because anytime we're producing an action that is like, power i get close to my mic to say something meaningful right now, now anytime we're producing force we have to understand that it's expression of force and there's a key difference because the raw producing ability of a for of force say of your quadricep can be easily measured through like an isokinetic kinetic device okay a dynamometer of sorts using research but the expression is multifactorial it has to do with motor learning how well your brain can organize its limbs and its muscles to actually express the force into the ground. And then what kind of structural adaptation the muscle has that allows for high potential. And so when I'm thinking about power development, you have to think about it in terms of expression, which means you have to expression as a whole. So neurologically, how I have my skill and then structurally the physiological potential. So potential and then efficiency is the way you can kind of look at it. And from a potential, potential standpoint, let's check the easy boxes. Do you need to be some level of strength? Because if you want to produce you know, high rates of force development, you better be able to produce high rates of force in the first place before you produce you know, a little bit of force fast. You'd rather have a lot of force fast. Um, you have to understand a little bit how transfer works. When you get stronger, you actually affect the entire force velocity spectrum initially. As you continue to get stronger, you don't. I have a simple uh, presentation on EdgeU on this, very easy to understand with an Excel spreadsheet that you can walk through. I'll give you a little visual demonstration here, very simple. Imagine that you weigh 200 pounds and you can only squat 200 pounds, body, body weight included, right? So 200 pounds, your body weight. Your body weight at that time is highly, highly influenced your ability to move your body weight by max force because your force capacity, if you think about a line, as I draw my line, my hand force is down here, velocity is up here, your body weight sits right here. So, but as I get this stronger and move it, my body weight actually changes relative to my ability to produce force. So my body weight in the theoretical kind of easy to understand might be 75% of the ability for me to produce max force. As I get stronger, it moves to 30%. And what we know is as it moves, it literally moves up a line, essentially. 
And initially when that line moves, well, it affects that initial spectrum of max force. My body weight falls in that. Now, as I've gotten stronger, my body weight's up here. And now I know the most efficient way to move this spectrum is through velocity means. So that's why I want to push velocity. And so now you're going to manipulate your training based on your relative body weight. And this is why when it comes to, oh, how strong, strong enough. Well, it's at what point does the spectrum stop being pushed? And I think it has a lot to do with relative body weight. And I have a wacky theory on it. It's based on force velocity curves and some of the um, re research on it. It's not founded in any actual research science. So it's kind of made up and you can totally ignore it if you want. But if you look at it, I think it's around 30% or 20% of your max producing force abilities, the linear dynamics, so the one-to-one -one kind of ratio, become curvilinear. It starts to tail off. So if you think about your body weight walking down that line, at some point, it's gonna walk off that linearity. It's gonna become in that curvilinear part where the transfer becomes less and highly, highly, or much more specific on other components. And that is where theoretically strong enough would occur. It's when your body weight relative to your systemic ability to produce force has become so low that you might be better off training other velocities. On top of that, to maybe substantiate some of that, we think about it like this. If I'm jumping from a static position, my velocity starts at zero. Right? I'm in the bottom position. And I produce a lot of force, a big kind of like a burst of force like a gun. And I start to move now because I produce force. Now, as I move my velocity increases. As velocity increases, it becomes physiologically more difficult to produce force. So that initial burst of force gets you going, but you continue to accelerate your already moving mass, which is moving at a velocity. You need to have the ability to produce force at those higher velocities. So then you have the initial burst, and then you have the accelerative force, and then at the top portion, we're moving your fastest, you have your highest velocity force. And so that's a simple way to look at it from a physics standpoint, beyond that of the you know, force velocity kind of theoretical standpoint. So when we're looking at power, get a bit back on it, it's force times velocity, but it's velocity at a context. It's not just arbitrary, because if I'm moving fast already, my ability to produce power is dependent on the force I can produce at that velocity. And so now I want to be able to strengthen those velocity specific force capabilities because that's going to influence my power. And that's where it becomes very interesting when we start to look at some of these dynamics of human movement and how force and power are being produced, how important is power, how important, should we even call it power? I don't know. Should we just call it force specific or velocity specific force producing abilities? Maybe because I think power carries this very, very confusing thing. It's like this other quality that somehow exists that's independent, but it's not. Power is a manifestation. It's literally a calculation based on force and velocity, right? Distance over work or time or the hell the other one people use. I always forget what it is. I sound stupid saying it. Um, and so it's like, okay, I should just think about it in terms of how fast can I produce force? Because that's rate of force development. Uh -huh. What factors go in there, we'll talk about in a minute. And then also, can I producing force at certain velocities? If I produce more force at a higher velocity, I therefore have more power. Example is, I have 135 pounds on my back. It's only, you know, for me, it's only 10% of my squat strength right now. Um, <laughs> and I move it, and if I move it at one meter a second one day, and the next day I move it at 1.1, I've moved it faster. The only way I've moved this bar faster at the higher velocities by producing more force. So in physics, our, our ability, our force, velocity is dictated by force in physics. How fast we move is dictated by how much force we produce. In physiology, force is dictated by velocity. As we move faster, it becomes harder to produce uh, velocity force. And that's some J.B. Moran's book, so I'll keep credit to him for a great quote because it really makes you think about it. So that's, then that's strictly from a static standpoint. That's like power producing abilities. I think it's really wonky the minute you add open chain dynamics, like a depth jump or approach jumps or even horizontal velocity into it. Because what happens is, as I smack my microphone, what happens is you start to change how movement is prepped. You start to change how the nervous system readies and you start to change some of the co-contraction dynamics that influence stretch shortening velocities. 
So that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, obviously, I think there's a lot to a lot to digest and break down. Um, how much can co-contractions have an effect on that whole system? Yeah, and so I mean, well, a lot of people talk about co-contractions being being good, being bad. Like what? What's very, very confusing, yeah. um, and it's totally understandable because there's never context provided to a co-contraction. It's just mm -hmm. like arbitrary. Oh, co-contraction's good. Co-contraction's bad. Um, so think about it like this, and this has to do with early rate of force development, late rate of force development. I'll weave into this as well. Yeah. When someone's jumping and landing, let's just pretend we're landing from a jump and this is my foot, I hit the ground. I theoretically am co-contracting in the air. What that allows is pretensed force. For example, if you flex your bicep, right? You have your tricep flexing and your bicep flexing. If you were to only flex your bicep, you'd hit yourself in the head, right? And so I flex, but I flex my tricep and my bicep. And that creates a net zero torque around my elbow joint, right? My arm's not moving anywhere, but it's not a net zero force. So I'm contracting. If I were to release my tricep, I'd smack myself in the head because my bicep has produced a lot of force around the joint of rotation, but it's being held back because my tricep's holding it back. Think about that in the same way of preparing to land for a movement. It's like hitting the ground running. You've prepped the musculature for the impact. Now, upon impact, you have a co-contraction because it helps stabilize the joint, and it's actually a positive motor learning adaptation only if it occurs quickly. So now we have a quick co-contraction, we hit, and then we take off and jump. What's interesting in the Russian study people talk about is like, oh, well, in EMG of Russian people, in Medvedev's study, it shows that uh, they have faster relaxation of a muscle. But why would that be important is a good question. That's a question I always ask. And it'd be important because if I co-contract quickly and hit the ground, if I can relax the backside antagonist, the one that's the tricep that's holding my bicep, if I can relax it quicker, I don't need to contract. Ooh, I just smacked my whole camera. I don't need to contract my bicep faster, right? Because it's already contracted. I need to learn how to turn off my tricep faster because I've already contracted my bicep quickly. And so now you start to think about it in terms, well, maybe that relaxation actually helped optimize force expression by releasing a unnecessary co-contraction that quote unquote was the brakes. And so we talk about relaxation dynamics. We have to understand they only coexist with contraction dynamics. So if we have early rate of force development, we're like it showed initially, right? Rate of force development, these muscles improved quickly. Mm -hmm. Well, that's great because guess what? It's not isolated to just your agonist, but your antagonist too. So if both muscles can activate quickly. Then I can have my force built up and then I can release even quicker. I turn off my triceps because my biceps are already built up to coincide with this. If we think about the stability load paradigm, then we have what happens is when like there's a great study, someone hits audible cue, they do a bicep curl, their calves contract first. So we're so busy thinking about the primary agonist antagonist, but if their calves are the limiting factor because they contract first, maybe systemic ability to have rate of force development is very important because we can contract our synergistic muscles quicker. And if we can contract our synergistic muscles quicker, the things that stabilize us, then we can contract the force producing musculature quicker. So it really makes you start to think about movement. Like, are we kind of doing this all wrong a little bit? Because we're isolated on our quads, our, cat, our hamstrings to co-contract and relax but maybe it's our core that's the initial contractor, right? Think about it like this. When you perform a lateral side where they've done studies, raise my arm out as fast as I can on my right side. The first thing to contract is your um, lower back on the left side because it's a stabilizer and your hips as well. Actually, the, one of the last things to contract is your primary mover. And when, it's just like shooting a cannon, you know, a cannonball out of a little rowboat. Yeah. That's a classic analogy, but no one ever actually explains why that analogy is important because it's important because you're actually bracing the sides faster. So if I have faster initial rate of force development, I can brace those sides quicker. I now can produce initial force faster in conjunction with my agonist main primary moving muscle. But if I hit the ground in a co-contraction, then I'm pulling off that last break to the last second. But it's only important if I can actually have a big co-contraction initially because there's no point to pull the brakes off if there isn't a break in the first place. 
And so what you see in EMG studies is that depth jumps are creating these co-contractions as a positive adaptation, but they're not is before they contact and they take off and they jump. And so co-contractions aren't bad, but co-contractions aren't good if they're excessive. So it becomes highly, highly contextual. And then that's where you get early rate of force development becomes neurological. And that's the ability for a, the nervous, the neural impulse to get to it. But let's not deny the fact that neurological could also be perception. It could be the ability of your brain to perceive how it could be even um, like your basal ganglia or your vestibular system perceive certain motions, which causes a co-contraction in a certain area of the muscle. So when you think about neurological, it's not just neurological, the structural properties, but then the motor learning organization, which is why it becomes very difficult because now you have to meld expression and potential unified into one outcome variable. So just if you were to break that down into uh, like this small, just chunk in pieces. Okay. For the listener, what would you say? Cause I love the analogy there where you said you've got to work that contralateral QL or whatever it is, if you're doing your, your lateral raise. So, and like the way I interpret that is, look, you've got to dig the founds before you build the you build the house. You know, you've got to really lay mm -hmm. those foundations. How do we how do we go about that? So, you to build those foundations. Obviously, you're talking about there. Maybe maybe it's something down to like core contraction, like glute, not necessarily glute activation, it, but you, a lot of it. I think has to do with. Sorry to interrupt you. Um, it has to do with your ability to perceive and act in a sporting action. And so we do a quite a bit of the general aspect, weight training, we lift weights, we get stronger, and we always rely on the sporting outcome to be taken care of the sporting coach. But we never actually, and I'll say we, and I shouldn't say that, never, but for the most part, sometimes, uh, we, the, the integration of other systems isn't always there. An example would be, uh, you, oh, you can only go and jump the minute you see uh, two laser pointers, red versus green, when you see green then you jump. We're adding perception into it. We're removing, we're making it a feed forward system where I have a prediction versus a feedback system like a squat because you can manipulate it. And so as a coach, what you should look at is, pre, and it's kind of actually a lot simpler than I explained it. Um, okay, there's general physical qualities. General physical qualities are done without the context of motor expression, meaning I can lift weights and if I'm training to jump higher, I don't need to make it contextual to jumping. I just want to get my hamstring stronger, do some hamstring curls. I want to do some knee extensions, get my knees, you know, get my quad stronger. That's hyper general. Mm -hmm. Then the integration of it comes from more specific training. Well, one step up would be a squat because it represents the jumping pattern. But even more specific than that is actually jumping to dunk a basketball. And so you look at a lot of the great dunkers of all time. Like these, a lot of guys on Instagram are now coming up um, and they talk about all how they become such great dunkers. They did it by dunking every day. <laughs> they, they didn't do it by like, strength training. And so, what's, yeah, what, a, what an idea. But the idea is, and they get, then they jump higher when they do the proper training too. But um, their ability to integrate it is better. I talked to someone who uh, worked closely with like the, a certain weightlifting team. I'm not going to name who, but what they said basically was from a young, young age, these guys are trained so well from a motor pattern standpoint that we integrate their motor system to acquire and utilize any new attributes. For example, if we learn and they can do the snatches and clean so well, that when we get their leg stronger with a knee extension, the carryover is so much better because their ability to take that new muscular strength and integrate it directly into the system becomes much higher. So if we're thinking about why isn't someone jumping higher in sports, well, we need to start to think about it as a whole. Is, is, it, are, is it something lacking perceptually, something lacking motor learning wise mm -hmm. that's holding them back because we've already tackled the structural box. So what's structural? The general physical aspect. Then you have, like, I call them specific qualities. So I want to do high-velocity squats. Great, wonderful. We're working on high-velocity strength. Then I want to do sports-specific training. So I might do a light load and doing semi-sports-specific movements, like a one-two-step approach, jump onto a box. And then I do my most specific, which is actually trying to dunk a basketball. Yeah, that makes sense. Just moving, moving through the continuum and essentially just getting closer, obviously, to the sporting skill all the time. Absolutely. Okay, so I'll just I'll move on here because I'm wary that we're getting on in time. Um, we talked off camera about high intensity interval training. Mm -hmm. um, I would just say go, but I'll give you a little bit of direction. <laughs> I, I can so, go ahead. So go ahead. We, we also we talked about in particular the Tabata study and how it's massively like 
it, everyone's kind of extrapolated it and taken it to mean the kind of confirmation bias or whatever they want to believe left, right and center. Like, what is it about that Tabata study that's good? And what is it that's so bad? And then why is interval training, or high intensity interval training massively overhyped? Um, so the Tabata study, to give people a background, we'll do it quick. Two groups, both very well trained. One group did 60, and if I speak wrong, please correct me. I think it's 60 minutes a day, 70% VO2, yeah. and they ran five days a week. The other group did 20 seconds on, absolute max effort, 10 seconds off, repeat for seven to eight sets for a total of basically two minutes and 40 seconds of work. Now, what happened was there were near equal adaptations to VO2, which is impressive because one group trained substantially less total volume time now you could argue workload is different but that's okay um and then they also showed that the tabata group had better anaerobic capacity based on how they measured it at that time now you could argue because how they measure it was a little bit different than how we might measure it now it wasn't taking lactate or they weren't taking a watt by power test or whatever um they're doing it based on like an epoch i think i if i read correct if i remember correctly it's kind of interesting point is the hit training produced aerobic outcomes adaptations they got better and uh through vo2 and then it showed also that they did it in a very short period of time the kicker on that is that you can assume adaptation is equivocal to stimulus applied so you can now say look it's not just hit training got great adaptations it's also hit training for two minutes and 40 seconds is equal metabolically cost wise to 60 minutes of training running at 70 percent of vo2 and the reason why that's very important is because now when you look at HIIT training going to 15, 20, 30 minutes, well, if you did a equivocal math calculation, that's like running for like four hours. Now, that's a little bit of an extrapolation of how we look at it, but it's kind of based on the assumption of physiological load. And it's probably the only assumption I can think of off the top of my head that'd be a means of trying to extrapolate workload demands. Because it's not like they measured uh, you know, ammonia excretion. They didn't measure certain metabolites or... Um, certain allostatic load parameters, um, they just measured, you know, how hard they worked. And so the issue is HIIT training is very, very demanding, very tiring, and potentially puts you, puts you at a state of, you know, potential overreaching, we'll put it politely. Um, and so it might not be the best means for trying to get certain adaptations in a setting where other stressors are being applied. That's kind of the short summary of it. How about that? Yeah, and I like it. And I think that was definitely for the listeners that have maybe haven't heard of that study. I mean, that study is getting on a little bit now as well. It's, was it 96, 97, something like mm -hmm. that? It, it was a while ago. Um, and I, the thing that gets me with it, a lot of people are still like, quoting, oh yeah, like the Tabata study. And it's got so many benefits like towards HIIT training and things like that. And it's like, yeah, mm -hmm. but you're not looking at maybe the long-term effects. I think if you look into the study, like, off the top of my head again, it's, um, I think the, the adaptations for the high intensity group stopped after three weeks. Well, they it might have, I don't recall the top of my head. Something like that. Yeah. It's like slowed down. Whereas if you look at the adaptations for the aerobic group, they continued. Now I don't know about you, but if I'm working with athletes and who were looking at maybe a four year collegiate career, I don't necessarily want to give them everything they can handle in kind of, you know, three week spell. We need to continually develop them over a four year spell. So like how, mm -hmm. how we go about designing the training program is going to be completely different because we're throwing the kitchen sink at them in for three weeks. Whereas yeah, we, can, we can provide a different stimulus over a longer period of time to get some better adaptations. I have no need to comment on that. You said that best. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> I don't know anything else to add. Absolutely. So what would you say if we go back to high intensity interval training, Obviously, it's very, it is a very stressful, potent stimulus, like you've said. How, how often, I know a lot of like fitness gurus and things like this are thrown at their clientele left, right, and center. And it's even been obviously used in, the, um, in terms of certain percentages, maximum aerobic speed within the Yeah, collision. you know, if... What should we do? Use it, some, use it cautiously. Mm -hmm. That's basically my, my answer for you. If you're going to go hard, go hard. If you're not, don't. Yeah. Um, but if you're going to go right in you know, the upper yellow, maybe that's not a good idea. Mm -hmm. um, but just, you know, find ways to apply it in a way that makes sense. That's literally, I can't tell you, I'm not your coach. Yeah. Uh, I don't know your athletes, but do it where it makes sense and appreciate the demands of it. Again, appreciate it. And I think the big thing is 
which I get frustrated on, on, a, on a personal level with like maybe coaches kind of caught in this stu- uh, study is obviously actually read the study, <laughs> understand mm-hmm. the ins and outs of the study and the, like, the, the long-term and short-term adaptations that were, that were found as a result of that. Absolutely. And that comes, that takes us nicely right back to the start where we started talking about research. Look at that. <laughs> there we go. And that's a great way to wrap it up right there. I don't think you planned it. <laughs> just, um, just finally here, I usually finish off with um, just one or two little things. So what advice would you give to, to a young coach trying to get into the industry or probably more applicable in this situation coming through their, their university, like undergraduate degree, what should they do to get the most out of their degree? Seek out opportunities, take time to invest in yourself and don't worry about what others think about you and your actions that you're doing that you are uh, performing as an investment to you. Perfect. That's it. Enjoy it. Have fun. Enjoy it and have fun. I remember that one. Um, any books you, that you'd recommend? Gavin Moyer, Biomechanics and Strength Conditions, a really good one. Most underrated biomech book. Drake, uh, Strength to Speed is going to hate me for saying that. He doesn't want, money. He doesn't want anyone to know about it. Great book. Um, read some biochemistry books, read nutritional chemistry, understand endocrinology, give a little, you give a little go at some books that you're not so comfortable with. And don't be afraid to read some, don't be afraid to read some marketing books too, because you are your own CEO ultimately. Perfect. And um, just finally, where, if they don't already know, where can people find you? So at strong underscore by underscore science is my Instagram page. You can check out www.theedu, so www.theedge capital u.com i can give you a link for that as well if you put in the notes yep. and uh yeah it's an educational website ran by paul fabrics and myself and we're here to help you guys learn and uh, give you everything you can um yeah, give you all the information i can provide in a way that uh you know hopefully gets you somewhere a little more a little closer to somewhere than you're not currently how about that there you go that's all you need to say all right Max, thank you so much for your time. I uh, greatly appreciate it. And I'm, I'm sure the listeners do as well. Thank you. Of course. Thank you everyone for having me on. And if you guys have questions again, feel free to reach out. I'll, I'll try and get to you back to you. I'm sometimes, that's a lie. I was going to say, ask me questions and I'll get back to you. I really don't sometimes. I got too many. I don't get notifications, but I'll do my best. I promise. <laughs> Thanks. Have a good day. All right. Thank you, my man.